Welcome to the Big Screen Symposium 2017 podcast. The Big Screen Symposium took place in Auckland on the 30th of September and 1st of October. Please note, while many of the speakers used clips in their sessions, we've edited these out to better suit the podcast. US talent agent Beck Smith chats to Jill McNabb in this in-depth conversation about the US agency system and her role in connecting talent, packaging their films, and the current state of play in the global market. I'm Jill McNabb from Vendetta Films and Vendetta Productions, and um, I am just going to take you through a little bit of a brief on Beck and where she's come from, and then we will kick into it. So Beck um, started off working at Inside Film magazine in Australia. She is a Sydney cider-ish, mm-hmm. North New South Wales. Um, and then moved across to The Hollywood Reporter as the bureau chief. Somebody's taking photos of me. Um, as the bureau chief in Australia, and then moved to working title as their head of development. Um, and that then moved her across to LA and to United. That makes it sound very, very simple, Beck, but I'm sure it wasn't. But we'll gloss over that so we've got lots of time to talk about um, agencies and packaging and all that fun sort of things. So um, let us kick off. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about your clients, first of all, who you represent, how this works. Beck is rather unusual in the agency world in that she both reps clients and she packages, finances, and sales. So she has lots of multiple jobs, which is relatively unusual, and we'll get into that later on. Um, clients we represent includes Mike Barbiglia, Joshua Oppenheimer, Mia Hansen-Love, Agnieszka Holland, Sebastian Silva, who was here a couple of years ago, was a fantastic guest. Um, and Australians, Garth Davies, um, David Michaud, Luke Davies, who are all here wonderfully, Ben Young, Jen Peterham, Warwick Thornton, and the agency represents Neil Cross, Carl Urban, all of the Concords, uh, Brett, Jermaine, Reese Darby. Um, and then on the packaging side, Beck has recently worked on films like Adventureland, Beginners, Briz- Brigsby Bear, Margin Call, and I Feel Pretty. And the agency has worked on Brad Status, Hidden Figures, Lady Bird, Room and The Big Sick. So lots of really high profile titles there, which lots of you will recognize, I'm sure. Um, So we're going to do a quick intro into the agency world and what that actually looks like. Yes, I've I've never actually used this uh, corporate overview. But essentially, I just wanted to give you guys a sense of what agencies in the US do because they are massive... um, massive entities with their tentacles in pretty much everything to do with any form of entertainment. So um, I happen to be in the motion picture group um, where I represent mostly writers and directors. Um, I'm also in the um, film finance group, the independent film group. But we also obviously have uh, television division, music, digital media, a theatre division, a book division, a production department representing DPs, editors and all the wonderful production folk. We've also recently purchased a a news and broadcast representation group, so we represent anchors and all that kind of thing, journalists. We just started a video game division five years ago. Um, We also consult to brands. We do marketing, brand strategy, um, licensing, endorsement. I mean, it's just enormous, basically, and it's been interesting to be um, at the company and see it grow over the last 10 years. Um, We actually had our retreat not that long ago and they asked the people who'd been at the agency for longer than five years to stay on the floor and everybody who was newer than that to get on the stage and we were just shocked because there were hardly any of us on the floor compared to the people on the stage. It was, it's just grown enormously and it's really exciting and fun. Um, uh, You know, different agencies have different personalities. You know, some agencies like to say that they only represent the creme de la creme, the top 10%. Some like to say, we are in the business of representing everybody, we're in the volume business. Um, UTA's personal philosophy is that we are 100% client, meaning that we, we like to think of clients as individual artists and uh, you know to sort of work out from who they are and what they want and, and sort of build from there. Um, and this is just a little bit about, you know, obviously we represent talented individuals, but then we're interfacing with, you know, studios and buyers and all the media corporations on the right there. 
We are dealing with all of these different banks and, and financing entities to finance our films and television projects. Um, you know, we're very, very deep in the digital media world and the technology world. Sometimes we're representing those companies. Sometimes they're our buyers in that space. And, uh, and there's a whole other section of the agency that's, you know, consulting to, to brands and helping them. I mean, most recently we signed uh, Uber's major competitor in the US, Lyft, for example, um, and are giving them brand strategy advice. So, uh, and there you have it. Um, we have offices all over the world now, well, in many, in many cities, and we have um, uh, the, the, the headquarters is in LA. It's a lovely place, and please come and visit us if you ever come to town. Um, so that's the general overview. Quite comprehensive. <laughs> So what about your role specifically? As I said at the beginning, you're, you're pretty unusual yeah. in what you do. Well, I was, I was brought in to uh, essentially to, to sign and represent writers and directors. Um, obviously, I come from Australia, so they were hopeful that that background would help them to strengthen their representation of talented people from this part of the world, and that's come to, come to pass. Um, they also wanted somebody that they could train up to become um, knowledgeable about film finance, essentially. So the job was to travel to all of the major festivals, so Cannes, Berlin, Toronto, Venice, Sundance, um, and you know sometimes other places, and China, so on, and essentially meet with people who say they want to invest in movies and figure out um, the parameters of their investment, you know, their model, kind of try and smoke out whether they're real or not, because there's a lot of bullshit artists in film finance, and essentially then have all that information to hand for the clients of the agency so that we can, when they have a project, we can then, you know, go to the right financiers and, and set the project up if it's not to go through a traditional studio type path. So. And you're finding clients at the same time. Yeah, exactly. So I'll go to film festivals and I'll, I'll be, I mean, shopping packages essentially will take our projects and we'll say, you know, we have this project with, say, this director, these actors, these producers. You've read the script before we came to the marketplace. This is what we're looking for in terms of film finance. And we'll meet with all the buyers and the investors and the banks and everybody and see if we can pull the finance together. So that's one thing that I'm doing at festivals. We're also showing finished films that we might be selling the distribution rights for. So typically agencies, talent agencies, it's a very odd thing for people from the rest of the world to understand. But talent agencies, these film finance groups, they also sell distribution rights. They act like a sales agent, specifically in the US, but increasingly they'll, they'll take up to uh, worldwide rights. And the difference is, I guess, that we don't actually take rights. We don't give you a minimum guarantee and we don't take any rights in your project. We just represent you. We're like a producer's rep, essentially. But we'll take that project to market for, for these producers and filmmakers and, uh, and sell whatever territory we're representing. Um, so, that, so I'll be doing setting up packages, selling distribution rights on finished films, and then I'll also be seeing movies and when I fall in love with some, something, um, going after the, the filmmakers in what is typically a very competitive environment amongst all the agencies and often super overwhelming for new filmmakers who are just like, what's going on? Why is everybody stalking me? You know. <laughs> and do you, you also do that with shorts as well as features? I do. I mean, it's just my personality that I, I love being with people from the beginning of their careers. So certainly when I started, um, you know, I mean, Dave Michaud and I go way back because we were originally working on Animal Kingdom together and I was an executive producer on that. Um, but, you know, I was working with David from Shorts. I was working with Garth Davis from his commercials. I was working with Ariel Kleiman, who just did Top of the Lake China Girl, um, directed that with Jane, um, from his short films. Um, Julius Avery, who's now directing a movie for J.J. Abrams. I signed him off a rough cut of a short, <laughs> um, Jerry Can. Um, so I did a lot of that, uh, especially in the beginning of my career. As I gathered more clients and kind of my time was a little bit more stretched, I was um, obviously looking 
because it takes time, right, to develop with these clients their careers. And so sometimes it's frankly easier as an agent to have that first feature already done. Mm. So I certainly started signing people off their yeah. first features as well. And um, how much leeway do you have to do that on your own? Or, or are you having to get feedback from the rest of the group um, within the agency? I've been there 10 years now. And certainly in the beginning, you know, I would have to run it by people and see if it made sense. Because when you sign with an agency, you're, I mean, of course you're signing with an agent or maybe a team of agents, but you want the entire group, you know, to know the work and like the work and want to represent you in a broader way. So in, in our department, the lit department, you know, there's some 35 agents. And while I may be David's primary agent, along with one other guy, Rich Klubeck, um, you know, we want those 33 other agents to know everything that he's done and be passionate about representing him too. And that's, that's the point of being represented in a major agency that you have all that support and machinery behind you, ideally. And how many clients would one agent represent typically? Um, you know, it depends where they're at in their career. Um, they can represent any, anything from like a few to hundreds, a hundred or more. Okay, so um, but, you know, this is also why we represent in teams because, you know, essentially people, you know, it's, it's good to have more than one set of eyes, more than one set of ears, you know, and more than one mouth out there talking about you, listening for opportunities for you, all that sort of stuff. Um, every now and then I need a holiday. I don't often get one, but, <laughs> you know, clients may or may not be taking a holiday at exactly the same time as me, so it's good to have um, backup and support and... You know, it's a, it's a demanding um, job and so we like to work in teams for that reason. Also, I may have a certain expertise, another agent may have other expertise. We obviously have specialists in the television realm. If you want to act as well, we're going to get you a talent agent like that. So some clients have literally teams of 10 agents. Others are just like, you know, especially people from from our part of the world or Europe or whatever, they're like, I can't do that. I'm not in, I don't want that. Like, I just want my person and I don't want to, you know, it freaks them out. So, you know, it's each to each client their own and it depends on their needs and their, the scope of what they want to do. And going back to those festivals then, is there one festival that you find the most productive or useful for you? Um, Sometimes people complain about going to the Cannes Film Festival. <laughs> I, I think that's ridiculous. I, I love it. It's, it's, I've been going there for 17 years and uh, it's, it's amazing. It's, you know, it's, it's high art, you know, of the highest order. It's this ridiculous, incredible, sprawling marketplace that's totally overwhelming and insane. It's all the best companies in the world. It's the south of France in May. <laughs> it's like, you know, I just love it. Not much wrong. Yeah, not much wrong. Apart from the locals. They're not very friendly. Yeah, oh, I like the French I too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when you do attach a client, what are the next steps? I'm assuming that if you're packaging a project together, ideally you want as many people from UTA as possible to be on board that project. It depends. I mean, you know... Um, I think it's like any job, right? When you have colleagues, you figure out who at that company you like jive with and get along with. And, and as an agent, you, you kind of figure out who you share a similar sensibility with in terms of the kind of work you like and the kinds of clients that you're attracted to working with. So I, while I work with many, many um, agents at the agency, there's, there's certainly certain agents that I'm just like, we don't have the same sensibility like at all and there'll be very little crossover and then there'll be certain agents that I work with again and again because we tend to be drawn to the same kind of work. Yeah, that makes if sense. If that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's talk about a specific, let's take a specific director, David, to start with, David Michaud. Okay. Um, so you signed him up after three sure. shorts in Sundance. Yeah, yeah. He, Actually, that was interesting because in, when I first started, uh, of course, the first person I said I wanted to sign was Dave because we were best friends and had done all this work together. Um, and 
they were like, they, they really loved crossbow, but they were just like, oh, you know, it's so early and maybe you should just, you know, get your sea legs and all of that kind of stuff. And then the next thing you know, you had three short films that were all in Sundance. At the, and I said, I'm just signing him. I'm just signing him. It's just <laughs> happening. So, um, so lucky me. And uh, so weirdly, because I developed Animal Kingdom with Dave back in Australia, I was the original producer. And when I became an agent, the wonderful Liz Watts um, got the film made with Dave as the producer and I became an executive producer. Um, so strangely, I ended up representing the distribution rights um, at market and uh, selling it to Sony Classics um, for those guys in the US. When you say you're representing the distribution rights, just North America? Just North America, yeah. yeah. There was a foreign sales agent on, so. Yeah. But that was really exciting. It was, you know, so that was the beginning of the journey and then uh, Dave had written the rover and um, we, uh, you know, he cast it with um, Rob Pattinson and Guy Pearce and uh, obviously a lot of money was available out of Australia for that film because it was shooting there and um, there was a gap of three and a half million so uh, Rich and I, who represent Dave, um, then represented Liz and Dave in the marketplace to go and raise that final uh, three and a half million which we ended up getting from a great um, foreign sales agency uh, called um, Film Nation. Mm -hmm. And they put that up as a guarantee and essentially a chunk of finance. They sold the international. We actually represented Film Nation in the, in the North American sale of that movie and ended up selling it to A24. So that was that. And then, and then War Machine, uh, that was a totally different thing because that was essentially Netflix is operating like a studio these days. So we didn't have to do any of that. It's more like, you know, there's, you, don't, you don't have to sort of do the same rigmarole of foreign sales and all that kind of stuff. What's your preference? Um, it totally depends on the film. I mean, I think that, I think that the, uh, it's a very interesting time because, um, you know, it used to be that you'd go through a studio, right? You, your Warner Brothers, your Sonys, your, you know, Paramounts and so on if it was a certain kind of movie that warranted worldwide distribution. And people that didn't end up, and, and that was obviously easier potentially for financially speaking than going and you know, raising all the money through foreign sales and all that kind of stuff. Um, but there's, all, there's also difficulties crea for creative people in working with studios. I mean, depending on who the executives are and the situation at the studio at the time, they can be very, very hands-on and involved and demanding and note you to death and be crawling all over your production and, you know, give you bad, lame notes that, you know, aren't in line with the movie that you want to make. So, you know, we hear a lot of that. You know, people um, choose to go the independent route or are forced to go to the independent route for different reasons. It can be because it's just not a studio movie. It's not, a, it's not a movie that's necessarily going to get, you know, worldwide traction and distribution, so it's not obvious for a studio. It might be, um, you know, elements like the cast isn't super well-known, the director's a first-timer, you know. Or it might be in the case of, say, like the Coen brothers when they wanted to do Inside Lewin Davis, obviously they've got a long working history with Working Title and Universal and so on, but they chose to do that movie outside of the system to... You know, I mean, obviously creative control is, is paramount for artists like that, but also financial upside. You know, you can structure the deals in such a way that when you're the Coen brothers, you might actually do better out of that deal than if you had gone through a studio. So, and so if, but if they're working with you, then what sort of deal are we talking? What sort of percentages are actually coming back to the agency? Um, so, yeah, that's a good point. So when you are represented as a client, it's a simple 10%. We take 10% of you know, what we do on your behalf, the deals that we negotiate for you. Um, but this film finance stuff and the sales and distribution stuff, that's a separate service and a separate uh, charge. And frankly, it makes sense if you think about it because um, anybody who was doing that work for you would be getting paid. It's, it's no different. Um, so it's usually 2.5% um, as a packaging fee um, with a floor and... Uh, and then the sales fee that we ask for is 10%. Um, and, you know, as always, it's a negotiation. It depends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So going back to the talent, I'm sure there's people in the room that want to know how they approach you, how they get discovered, how they can actually be attached to an agency. So 
Can you talk about how that works? I mean, obviously you go to the festivals, but how are you discovering talent? Well, I think, I think the hardest thing for um, working artists who want to, you know, would like the help of an agent is like, yeah, how do I get discovered? How do I get seen? I think that the first thing I'd say is I do firmly believe that, that the work that is... Um, the, the great work rises to the top and, you know, I think that agents are going to sign you off sh sheer talent, but also if they see a work where they're like, I know what to do with that. I know how to take that particular film out into the universe and kind of create more opportunities for this filmmaker. So it's a very, very um, competitive business, the agency world, and increasingly people are signing people very young, uh, sorry, very early, off shorts often. Um, and so, you know, I think that agents rely on, you can't, you can't, we get a lot of these query letters, you know, like, hey, I, I've done this, can you check it out? And, you know, I, in the beginning, I used to reply to everyone and, you know, I'm, I'll get to it when I can and, you know, all that sort of thing. And then after a while, you just realise that, as much as you would like to, you just don't have the human capacity to, to do that, you know. You just spend all day trying to look at stuff. And, um, and so agencies have a policy where they can't accept unsolicited stuff. And what that means is that it has to come to us through some trusted source. So a producer we know, a lawyer we know, you know, a festival we know, you know, like something like that. It has, you have to get to the agency from someone who already has a relationship with that agency, ideally. Um, and if you don't, they either won't reply or they'll send you a letter saying, sorry, we can't accept unsolicited material. But agents are out there scouring every day and night for exciting new talent. So they're on Vimeo, they're going to labs, they're you know, going to festivals, they're talking to producers, they're talking to their lawyer friends, they're, you know, they're, they're just out there all the time, you know, asking people, what have you seen, what have you heard, what are you excited about? And so I think my only advice would be, don't look for an agent, just make great work because you'll get signed. Wait till it I happens. believe, yeah. But do you ever come across um, people who have made great work that hasn't yes, particularly been noticed. Absolutely, absolutely. And no, no, it's been noticed, but maybe the agency thinks that person wants to do such small, handcrafted, independent work with very limited commercial reach. And while we appreciate the artistry, you know, we're also in a business. And so maybe that person doesn't need my services and they can just keep making that beautiful personal work you know, they don't necessarily, if they don't show the ambition to go beyond that kind of very personal scope of work, then they may not, you know, benefit from or need the services of an agency. So what is the approach when you do find someone? Is it um, a simple chat? Is, how does it go? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's, it's usually just email, pick up the phone, you know, arrange to meet if you're at a festival. Um, and that's it. And you get together, and if you get along well, and uh, that's what I was going to say. How much is talent, and how much is relationship, and if you think you're going to get on well and be able to work with that person? Well, I'm very lucky. I have lovely clients who happen to be extraordinarily talented. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I think I think that I think that being a, like you have to decide what's important to you. Like for me. You know, there's, there's some agents who just are happy, like they're just deal makers. That's just all they do. That's all they care about. And they're like, where's the money and let's go. And like, you know, they're not interested in the creative. They're interested in whether they can make a deal. And I'm not like that. You know what I mean? Like I, I deeply, deeply care about the work. I want to be able to have conversations with the client about the work. And hopefully they at least care somewhat what I think. You know what I mean? And, and uh and that's important to me. So I want to be able to, you know, have that kind of a dynamic with the people that I work with. Um, and, you know, but, but more important, I think when you meet with a, with a potential client, you, the work is the primary thing, but it's also like, how do they present, you know, are they going to be able to go out into the universe and excite people with their vision, essentially? Mm. Are they articulate? Yeah. Let's still get some speech-making lessons or something. Um, 
And how how much how often are you actually talking to each of your clients? Like what does what does a day look like to you or a week look like to you? When you're actually um, in the office and not at a festival? Well, it sort of depends what's going on in the client's life. Like if they're off making a movie, they don't want to hear from me. Like I'm the last person they want to hear from. Um, if they're, you know, in a moment of anxiety where we're trying to sell their movie and it hasn't sold yet, I need to speak to them every single day, you know. Yeah. If they're, um, you know, if there's, if we're thinking about different opportunities and we kind of, you know, um, and it also depends on the person, you know. Some people want a lot of connectivity. Some people just aren't like that at all. And so it's just about finding the slipstream with the individual and, and seeing what they like. Um, and yeah. how's the balance there with their manager versus their agent? Because uh, to my understanding, managers think that agents do nothing and agents think that managers do nothing. Managers do nothing, let's be clear. <laughs> um, no, I, I mean, I think that, uh, in fact, Luke's manager is amazing and one of my favourite people. Um, uh, good managers are worth their weight in gold. Um, bad managers are a pain in the ass. Um, but what I would say is the idea was the, the difference between managers, uh, agents and managers, um, managers came about because agents got so busy. You know, if you have such a large client list, you know, can you really give the time and attention that some artists would like, you know? Um, so I think at the end of the day, you, you know, agents are legally allowed to make deals. Managers are not supposed to do that in California. So um, they're, not, they're not supposed to solicit deals, but they do. You know, but in, but legally speaking, agents and lawyers are licensed to make deals. Um, you know, I think that you can sort of start with an an agent if you have that opportunity and you're happy and excited with that person. And then if it's not enough, or if you want more, or if you'd like more daily content, it, there's different reasons why people want managers. Like managers have the time to give creative notes. Um, agents typically don't as much. Um, you know, managers might be more across your schedule and like your, you know, where do you need to be? And some people just like that support. Some people like talking to somebody every single day. They just like that. And, you know, it's hard for agents to talk to every single client every single day. So it's just like, it's the needs of the individual. But of course, the other question is that it's an extra 10%. So you have to, for every layer of representation you add, you have to pay more. So that's the... Yeah. So the talent is paying agent, manager, lawyer, lawyer, taxes. Yeah. yeah. Business yeah. manager. Okay. The bigger your career gets, the more you might find you have layers of representation, publicist. Um, but hopefully you're earning more as well. Exactly. So That's works. the idea. Yeah. That's the idea. Okay. Um, can you talk a bit about how it works internally at the agency when a client comes in or a project comes in? Do you have, you know, are there weekly catch-ups? Are there? How, how does it work inside the team? Uh, agencies are famous for like you know, I can't get you know I can't talk now. I'm going into a staff meeting. <laughs> I just got out of a staff meeting. I need to catch up. I'll call you soon. Staff meeting. Staff meeting. Staff meeting. So every Monday we'll get together and we'll talk about cool stuff that happened for all of those groups that I showed you before. They'll kind of highlight the very most exciting things that happened so that we can go out and like how many people are in that room. Like a hundred, and uh, so you got to be judicious about when you decide to raise your hand and talk about something. Um, but the idea is that you have that machine behind you, and when we have these great, exciting stories <clears throat> that our clients have been a part of, we want to tell everybody out there that that that's going on. Then on Tuesday, we the motion picture talent group gets together with the motion picture literary group, <clears throat> and we talk about exciting scripts that we've read. It's a very, sh it's five minutes, that section. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, but. Take we, note writers. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's really like, no. so all the, like scripts come in from all over, like producers and all over the place, like, and then they want an agent to read it. They give it to whoever they think could be their best advocate internally. And um, if they like it, they'll bring it up. And they'll say, I read this script, you know, there's no director yet, there's no cast yet, you know, there's no producer yet. And so I think it's a, this is what it is, you know, it's period drama, blah, 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 blah. This is why I think it could be good. And 
this is, you know, this is a great opportunity for these kinds of directors or these kinds of actors. And, you know, so, so we do that. And the idea is that we then, you know, jump in and help to, to you know, educate our clients about the opportunity and, and ideally package that material. Um, and that can, that can be everything from a book, you know, um, right through to a script. Um, and, and then we do what's called the grid, the dreaded grid, which is where we have, you know, opportunities at Sony, opportunities at Warner Brothers. You know, it's basically like open directing kind of, you know, these, these assignments that they have where they're looking for a director or they're looking for cast first or they're looking for whatever. And again, we sort of talk about what it is and one or more agents may have read that script and either recommend it or say that it's flawed because of X, Y, and Z. And so everybody, because I can't read every script out there. No, no single agent can. And so we all kind of support one another to read the breadth of the material out there. And um, yeah. So is someone writing coverage on every script? Is that not every script? We have we have a coverage department. We have a reading department. Um, and you know, I'm pretty honest with people. Like if they send me a script, I'll say, look, I'll get it covered first because my reading pile's so deep and. I have to prioritise, but let's get it read first. And if the coverage comes back favourable, then that's really helpful. And uh, then agents can read it. Sometimes agents will just read it off the bat too. Like if I get something sent to me from a producer that I know and respect and who's, you know, a, a, an important relationship, obviously I'm going to put that at the top of the pile. If it comes in from somebody that I know less and maybe they haven't got that really established track record yet, but maybe a friend said you should give back a call or whatever, I might tell them, look, let me get it covered in the first instance and then we can go from there. This is a personal question for me because I struggle with that. Um, when you have that pile of scripts, how do you actually manage it effectively in terms of, oh, this one actually needs to shift to the top? Like, how are you actually failing and, and saving everything? And I have a grid. I mean, I have, a, I have an incoming grid that lists what came in from who, which client it came in for, you know, and the date that it came in. And I do my very best to get back to people in a timely fashion. It's really hard. You know, I'll get as many as eight scripts a day. It's not humanly possible for me to read everything that's sent to me. Are you able to read during the day ever? Um, sometimes I will go home and do that if I really need to. Um, or I have read at the office, but the answer is no. I mean, we're reading evenings and we're reading weekends. So, yeah. <laughs> Sounds familiar. Um, so, when a script comes in, what's the preferable, um, you know, the, the place that that script is at, the people who are attached, what do you prefer to see? Um, so, I should just preface this by saying that because you guys are all from the international realm, these talent agents have these independent film groups or film finance groups. We have one, CAA has one, William Morris has one, ICM has one, and even Gersh and, you know, they all have um, agents that work in that group. And I actually think it's a really good way for you guys to go in because they're typically internationally minded people who go to festivals and know and care about people from the international scene, you know. Um, unless you, obviously, if you have relationships with, uh, with lit agents or talent agents, go for it. But it can be hard to get attention otherwise, and I just think those independent groups can be helpful. Um, for me, I'm looking for material that's just simply excellent, that can offer a great opportunity for directors I work with, or books that offer great opportunities for writers that I work with, or articles. Um, and I think ideally it would come in and you wouldn't just say, please read this script and give me your ideas. You'd come to me and you'd say, I've got this script. I think it's great for so-and-so, who, who I represent or who the agency represents. But also that you'd be open to my other ideas. For example, if that person's very busy or that person's not reading or that person's not realistic, you know, or whatever it is, I think it's good if you can be open to other suggestions of clients that might be good for material like that. And also if we send you movies to look at, for example, that you actually watch them and you actually, you know, get back and say, well, we like this and don't know that that's quite right and love to get on the phone with this person, love to have them read, whatever. Um, and the same for actors, you know. Yeah. 
But I think as well, for, from, for the kinds of directors that I work with, it's, um, it's not always the best if an actor's attached, you know. Those, casting is such a massive part of what a director does and I, I often have conversations with directors saying, what, 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 what? Like, what's left for me to do if there's an actor attached? But from a producer's perspective, taking your agent's hat off, what's best for them to keep more control of their project when they're coming to you? Well, they're not going to lose control. I mean, look, the minute, you, the the minute you give uh, a project to an agency, you've got you to gotta believe that it may do the rounds, right? Like, unless you very, very, you have a very, like I get scripts from certain people who ask me not to share it and I will honour that. But I know that, uh, depending on the situation, that's just not how agencies work. Once they get their hands on a piece of good material, they're running all over town trying to package it, finance it, like, you know. So, but at the same time, you need agencies to help. So if they're running at you with a lot of passionate energy and saying that they love your script, I say, I say go for it, you know. And ultimately, depending on where your director comes from and your cast comes from, you can then utilise the machinery of that agency to help you with film finance and, and with sales as well. Okay. Um, we're going to take a look at a couple of specific projects and talk through okay. um, how they were put together. So Partisan is the first of those. We've got a trailer to show, please. Okay. So this film was directed by, written and directed by um, Ariel Kleiman. Um, I'd started working with Ari after I saw his short films uh, in Cannes, Deeper Than Yesterday, which won the Kodak Discovery Award there and was an extraordinary 20-minute film. Um, he wrote this script with his partner, Sarah Klinger, and it was very unusual and unique and interesting and, you know, fantastic voice. Tour de Force role for, um, for the father, who was kind of running this cult and training children to murder, to, to maintain his, his lifestyle with his many wives and children. Um, and I guess on that one, basically, we first of all gave it to... Uh, to Oscar Isaac, actually, who's a UTA client, and he became attached, and then, uh, and then got. He was just at that point where he got like a ma another massive opportunity. He ended up falling off. So, Vanson Cassell is not at UTA, but I called uh, his agent, who I know from CAA, and we were able to get the script to Vanson, who read it and and uh, got into an email thing with with Ariel, and then ultimately attached and. Uh, the other thing that we did, it was a foreign sales agent called Protagonist out of the UK. Um, you know, great guys and good taste. And, um, and together we worked to raise the missing million on that film, um, which we what got. What was the budget? It was four point something. Um, and so we raised that money out of the US from a really cool company called Animal Kingdom in New York. And they're sort of like a, you know, they're a classy company with great taste and... Uh, the head of that company used to produce for Robert Altman and, you know, they were just interested in Ariel and his voice. And so, and then ultimately we, we um, helped position the film for Sundance and then sold the distribution rights. So you were across the whole... Yep. Yeah. Yep. And so just, to, yeah, so that was that one. Hopefully and, was. and how many of the films that are releasing that you're selling or financing, how, how many of those are you involved in every single part of? I mean, that's obviously the preference. Um, most of them that mm. I'm, I, I, pro I probably am involved in, in financing and selling 10 films a year. Um, some, you know, some with my clients, some with clients of the agency and, and, uh, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty soup to nuts, but sometimes we'll get, you know, stuff come to us as a finished film, even like that film 1%. I don't know if you guys have heard of this Aussie biker movie that was just in Toronto, but, um, that was something that came to us as a finished film and, uh, you know, a colleague saw it and loved it and took it on for sale and we sold it to A24. So it can be like very, very beginning stages right through to finished film stage. So were you actually in competition with A24 to acquire the rights because technically they could have just gone straight and bought those rights? Well, they hadn't seen the film. Mm. We were brought on by the producer to represent them in the marketplace and sell those distribution rights in the same way that any sales agent would be. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the end of the tour is the next Oh, one. this is just an interesting one. I, I work with a brilliant um, American filmmaker named James Ponsoldt. 
Um, I signed him off his first film called Off the Black, which almost no one has seen, um, starring <laughs> Nick Nolte, a really good film actually. And then we've worked together uh, on a lot of projects since then. We started with Smashed, which we saw, financed and then sold to Sony Classics. Then we did The Spectacular Now with Shailene Woodley and Miles Teller, um, which we sold to A24. Then we did this film, which I just love this film so much, um, about the late, great David Foster Wallace. Um, so we can show that clip quickly. And this was a very intimate film. Can you hear me? Sorry. This is a very intimate film um, that we, with Jason Siegel playing David Foster Wallace, um, the author of Infinite Jest, and, and Jesse Eisenberg, both amazing actors, and you would think super, super famous, and, you know, he's been in The Muppets and everything, and $3 million. $3 million is what we made this movie for. I think people might be quite surprised you said $3 million yeah. that you are working on That's films. why I brought it up, just yeah. because I know that everybody struggles to get their films made, but you guys are so lucky in uh, the rest of the world, frankly, to have the cultural subsidies that you do, in, in my humble opinion. It's really, really tough for American independent filmmakers. They don't have any of that, and so they're totally... They, you know when you get your foreign sales estimates? Um, they actually have to make the film fit inside that box. And it's really, really hard because that, that whole sort of matrix of foreign sales is, is more challenging than ever. It's harder to get buyers to pre-buy uh, films um, than it ever was. And that's because there's a lot of films, you know, and, uh, and the theatrical marketplace is very challenging. And so buyers will, distributors will sit back now and they'll just go, well, let's just see it first. And that's even if the filmmaker's proven and the cast is known and, and you know, if it's a, this is, this is about two writers, you know, on a book tour, talking about life, the universe and everything. It's not an obvious commercial concern. And as it turned out, it wasn't a massive box office hit, even though it was possibly one of the critically most lauded films of the year. It, it, at the end of the day, it's still, it's still hard to make these films connect with a broader audience. Which is the most depressing thing. Which when is totally a film depressing. That's five stars oh. and wonderful. I and, know, I know. Yeah. And then something like Sharknado makes. Yeah. So when, of you're, when just to finish something on that though, so when you're in that space, when you're not really in the pre sale marketplace, um, you're ultimately you're making a film for three million dollars or less. Because asking somebody in America to write a check for more than that is just like a little insane. It happens. It happens. But rarely. So how do those actors get attached? I mean, what are you? What are they actually being paid? Because obviously it's going to be below their regular quote. I are mean, they back in. Yeah, I mean, great actors will work on these kinds of projects because they're extremely excited about the material, uh, and extremely excited about the director. Mm. Um, they either know the director or they know of the director, typically. Um, every now and then just a great piece of material comes along and we can talk about that with Margin Call. Um, uh, but, you know, more typically it's a, a wish to work with that director that gets people attached. Okay. Are you okay to move on to Margin Call now? I think we yeah. the time. Can we show the Margin Call trailer? Oh, no, no, hold on. We're not showing Margin Call. We're showing the circle. Let's, so, so I just want to show you. So after this film and also The Spectacular Now, which is also beloved, James then went from two $3 million films to this film, which is Tom Hanks and Emma Watson. Um, I can tell you the story of that in a minute, but it's a very, it's a very different film. It had a very different critical response. It was super hard for James, honestly, because it didn't quite connect. Um, but it, it just shows you the scope of the independent realm as well and what we're doing in America on that front. I had a bit of a circle-like experience here at this conference. <laughs> I was just uh, talking to Dave and we realised that we were on Facebook Live a little bit too late after our very uh, personal conversation. <laughs> anyway, um, so, so the circle, you know, James had really built a reputation as a, an extremely fine young filmmaker and gathered a lot of fans, including David Eggers, you know, the author of The Circle, very big American novelist, and... Uh, and Tom Hanks. So that, that was something that we helped James option. And then uh, he, he then became a producer and adapted the script, ad yeah, adapted the book, sorry, to, um, and then took the, the script to Tom. Tom came on as a producer and star. And um, we actually cast uh, Alicia Vikander originally and went to market with that package. It was, this is another thing that people should know is that when, 
when there's two agencies, like Tom's at CAA and James is at UTA, so we ended up co-repping, they call it, co-representing the project in the marketplace. And that happens a lot because often actors won't come from where the director comes from and that kind of thing. And the, the cost is not more, it's just they split it. Um, I wish I could say it's half the work, but that's not true. Um, and so that was obviously a big package to take out in the independent marketplace. And that was something that um, we were able to pre-sell. Um, but, but we also, we had so many financiers that were really excited by it that we ended up finding somebody to commit to the $20 million price tag of that movie out of the gate on the belief that they were going to be able to, you know, take a lot of their risk away by taking it to Khan and selling the foreign, which is ultimately exactly what happened. And then there were scheduling issues with Alicia, so uh, the lovely Emma Watson uh, came in. And, um, but that was interesting too because, you know, some buyers were very invested in the idea of Alicia and weren't so sure about the change and, like, that's all very interesting too. Can you just talk about that in terms of diversity and the issue of diversity and gender and... Um, in casting, because obviously it's a massive talking point. What what do you have in place at the agency to, you know, try and overcome the issues that exist? Just a point of view, you know. I mean, da James and I <clears throat> would talk to a lot about trying to, you know, at least at least in one of those main roles to to have some diversity. And you know, he but he's... you don't have anything overarching for all of the films that you're. We don't. We don't together. have a quota as yeah. such. No. I mean, we would. We don't. We're not telling our directors how they should cast. You know. I mean, I think it's as an agency, we certainly want to. Uh, we want to challenge people. I mean, there's a filmmaker I work with named uh, Lake Bell, very talented actress who also writes and directs, and she'd done this great movie um, called In a World and. Uh, and uh, she was pitched on a studio comedy, you know, and the, the head of the studio, who was a woman, said, oh, I don't know if Lake's really ready to make that leap. And the male agent just batted back and said, you know what, I don't think you'd be saying that if she was a guy, because we happen to represent the same person that went from a $4 million uh, Sundance independent film to making Kong Skull Island, you know, and no one has an issue with that, you know, but they have uh, an issue with a demonstrable talent, you know. It's, and, you know, she did turn around and say, you know what, that's a really good point. And so I think that there's a lot of that going on in Hollywood where people are just like, not good enough, you know. But you think you it's an issue down the chain. You're saying buyers wouldn't necessarily respond. A hundred percent. I mean, there's like, you know, there's all, I mean, racism is endemic and it's everywhere and people have these because they're fed the same bullshit over and over and over and over again, they never kind of, they have a mindset, you know, including movie going audiences for years have been, you know, fed these narratives, you know, I love my white men, I just want to say that out of the gate, but, you know, by white men, about white men, primarily with, you know, women playing support roles or, you know, sort of servicing a male kind of, um, you know, kind of narrative and, uh, you know, you're only bit, you're, if you're not white, you're, you're, you're often not, you know, getting a lead role. And so I think it's really um, great that we're in a, in a place where people are saying that's not good enough anymore. We have to, as a community, challenge that because the statistics are absolutely dire. Horrific. And so, you know, um, so you're seeing that change. 6% of directors attached to films announced until 2025 are female. Yeah, I mean, that's brutal. pretty shocking. But that's why when Wonder Woman comes out, it's fantastic, you know? Um, Patty Jenkins, enough people said that thing of like, why can't Patty Jenkins direct Wonder Woman? You know, you're giving all these guys, you know, be it the director of Jurassic Park, who'd also just done a small movie and, you know, and then it's just weird. Like you get, you get people like Kathy Kennedy saying, oh, we just can't find the women to direct stuff. It's like, wow, what's going on? I don't get it. So I think all we can do is, as a community, um, watch our own unconscious bias. We all have it, you know, I think everybody has it. And we just have to try and snap ourselves out of that way of thinking and open our minds. I could talk about this for all day, yeah. but we'll move on to Margin Call. <laughs> so, so Margin Call, this was um, uh, 
Zachary Quinto, the actor, was also starting a production company and he had this friend that he went to film school with named JC Chandor, who'd never made a movie. And um, they brought us this script, which we thought was really good. I don't know if you guys have seen Margin Call, but it's an excellent film. And um, this one came together because we could not get it made. I mean, first of all, it was just hard to get the cast. And this is one of those things where, you know, you just go at it a thousand different ways. And I think Zach ended up calling someone who called someone who was finally willing to call Kevin Spacey. And when Kevin Spacey came on board in what was ultimately an ensemble thriller, um, loads of other actors just went, oh, okay, I'll take this seriously. <laughs> and of course, J.C. Chandler went on to become a very um, well-known director. Yep. This was also made for $3 million and we had to make it out of Canada because we could get more. And this one, that one was really fun because it, you know, we, we sold it and Lionsgate took it out and they really did an amazing job and it really connected with audiences. And you were asking before about actors and what they'll work for. I mean, I think on something like that, when you're talking in the sub $5 million range for the budget, there's something called Schedule F, which is kind of about $60,000. And actors, uh, you know, will work for that kind of money on something that they're passionate about, you know, provided that they're obviously they need to do the big movies too to <laughs> make up for these passion plays. And part of what I do is, is I can, you know, being in the middle of just sort of trying to help figure out the back end and what it's, that's always what's really tough is kind of trying to figure out who gets more or less of the back end is always where it gets really tricky. But in the end, you get through it. It's always hard, but we get through it. Yeah. So I suppose everyone's wondering, how do we get those actors of that calibre down here working at Schedule F? Pay them a lot of money. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I mean, I think it's like, you know, partly, yeah, pay them a lot of money because it's hard for these actors to do a passion play on a movie on the other side of the world away from their families. Like, I'm just telling you the logic of how some actors think sometimes. Um, it's just a psychological thing. People with it so far, it's so far. You're like, it's only three more hours than London. Like, what are you talking about? It's so far. Um, <laughs> They just, it's a mental leap that people seem to find hard to, to take. But I, look, the one thing is that you are in a great position because of the subsidies to pay actors a little bit more than what they're forced to pay them in America. Nobody wants to pay actors this kind of money on, on when they have profiles like that. Nobody wants to. You know, they all deserve more, of course. But, you know, in America, they're just forced to. Like, there's, it's sheer marketplace... Um, it's just sheer economics. Um, and because you have the cultural subsidies here, you can afford to pay people a little bit more and, uh, and get better production value and things like that. And again, I think it's, you know, do you have an exciting piece of material or a great director that those actors want to work with? It's that simple. Yeah. Okay. Um, we've only got 10 minutes left, so we're, I'm, I'm going to take some questions, but I just want, first of all, just um, to ask you about SVOD and the changing landscape, because we haven't talked about that. At all. Yeah. So can you just Well, I mean, I've been doing this for 10 years and it's just been really interesting to see, you know, um, to, to see the sort of slide of the foreign sales marketplace and how it used to be that you could finance your entire movie out of the foreign sales realm and then just keep, you know, North America free and that was all your upside. That the, Those days are, you know, for, for most films, those days are gone. Um, so that was one interesting trend and people have had to take bigger risks and, and be more inventive and, and, and push their budgets down. Um, and then I think the other big disruptor has been, um, I mean, I just feel so <laughs> jaded sometimes because friends that I made, you know, the companies that they work for have come and gone and their jobs have come and gone and, like, they pop up elsewhere and whatever, but you just... You see a lot of musical chairs um, in terms of executives, but you also see a lot of companies coming and going, whether it be financiers or whether it be distributors. I mean, you kind of see the Sony classics of the world, you know, they're like there forever. They're just like, they just know how to do it, right? Those guys are so conscious of how they spend their money. I mean, they are, that's why they buy movies that get great reviews because then that does the publicity for them and they don't really have to spend in a massive way to get their movies um, noticed. Um, but for every Sony Classics, you know, we've seen companies come and go and uh, 
you know, whether it's Paramount Vantage or whether it's Warner Independent or whether it's, you know, and then seeing the emergence of interesting new companies like A24 and Orchard. The Orchard and now Annapurna going into distribution, um, Megan Ellison's company. So, you know, it's it's interesting. and and But, of course, the biggest players, the monsters, have come in the form of the SVOD players, Netflix and Amazon, and now Hulu. Um, I think that what's interesting is that you know, Netflix didn't really, no, nobody was particularly interested in making movies for Netflix in the beginning, right? Because everybody longs for, I mean, longs for a theatrical release. You know, often filmmakers long for a theatrical release and Netflix wasn't necessarily um, offering that. And so it was a lot for filmmakers to wrap their head around. But when you're in a situation where the numbers just don't make sense, you know, um, and Netflix is offering to pay you way more than the marketplace is even saying it's worth, and you all get paid proper fees and you get the production value that you'd like, that's very tempting. And so filmmakers started to say yes to that. Um, is it your experience that people do have more leeway and less, more creative control with Netflix? Um, I think Dave spoke about that the other day, feeling like, you know, that Netflix was a very good um, collaborator in that way, in the sense that they weren't crawling all over him in the way that we often hear studios <coughs> might be super controlling. Um, they tend to, at least thus far, and we'll see if this changes because a man named Scott Stuber, who used to be in the studio environment, has now taken over there. Um, and maybe he'll have a different approach, but um, they tended to, at least to now, put their trust in, in great producers and filmmakers and just say, go do your thing. That's why we want to be in business with you because you're already proven and great. Um, the interesting thing about Netflix is that, you know, they don't, they don't do, you, there's no back end, right? You don't, there, there is no back end. They, they basically we're giving people a premium on top and saying, we'll pay you this in advance. That's like a, in lieu of back end because you're not going to ever see a back end. Um, and while that was also tempting because we've, you know, everybody who's made a film knows that often the back end never turns into anything, right? Um, so it was exciting to get paid a back end, a guaranteed back end. But, you know, the CEO of UTA is fond of saying that, that our company was built on back end. Mm. You know, for every film that doesn't make it into the, the black and, you know, turn into an exciting back-end prospect, the ones that do, they're really, really valuable yeah. for, for the people and companies that were involved in those films and television projects. So what we have with Netflix, it doesn't matter if 50 million people see War Machine, you know, like the people who made War Machine are going to see a certain amount of back-end um, that was paid up front and that's it, you know. And, but look, they paid a lot of money to make a great film and Dave got to make the film that he wanted and so it's always a, you know, it's, you, you kind of got to look at the options at the time and decide, you know, what's the most exciting for you. Um, um, and Frank, it would have been a risk, you know, who knows if we went and made this with New Regency or whatever, like, who knows? Who knows what would have happened? Um, the other... The other interesting player, of course, is Amazon. And I feel like Amazon kind of sat back and, like, made a lot of money, you know, with all their people buying shoes and stuff, and then then just kind of watched what Netflix did and went what, and listened to the community and whatever they were co kvetching about or complaining about in terms of Netflix. And then they went, OK, OK, they don't like that and they don't like that and they don't like that they want a theatrical release. And OK, we're going to do that. We're going to allow a theatrical release and we're going to allow a back end for these filmmakers. And then they, I mean, it was, it was really fun as a seller because, you know, you're going into a marketplace and all of a sudden Amazon's like, yes, we'll take Manchester by the sea for $10 million and we're going to give it an Oscar campaign and we're going to, and they did. And it was like, wow, they're like paying a lot of money and they're giving a back end and a theatrical release and they're really competitive with Netflix. So that was... Fun for us, you know. <laughs> um, and then now Hulu are the, yeah. the, new, the new company coming through, although they haven't really dived into. But I, I expect to see more of this, and I think that in, now it's Apple and it's, you know, the, we had started to say uh, five years ago that we expected that the major studios would be really, like, competing in a major way with these players, and that's coming to pass very quickly. Yeah. Okay, questions. There's one right at the back. First of all. So going back to the margin pool example, 
Yeah. So on a three million US budget. It might have been more. Honestly, I can't remember. It's a while ago. But it was under five. Thank you. So how many days should you think that would roughly be? And is it a case then that we're all about scheduling and getting those actors to stay out? Yes. In and out as soon as you possibly can. Yeah. The shoot days are brutal on American independence. People shoot films for as little as 17 days. Often they do for 23 days. You know, you might get 28 days on these kinds of budgets if you're really clever about the way that you do it, but it's brutal. And are those filmmakers, providers, and directors having to defer a lot of their fees in order to make money? Of course. Everybody's, everybody's doing these projects for less than they deserve. And it's really tough and it's just everyone in the boat together. And you know, you have, I always, <laughs> I always say to clients who come to me with an independent film, do you love this so much that if you can't make it, you want to stab yourself in the heart? Because <laughs> unless you're that passionate about it, maybe you should spend your talents on something else. <laughs> Great. Um, do you think in terms of the SVLD space, um, <coughs> is it, are they established? You mentioned earlier that, you know, if it's not a studio picture, then it's probably, you know, it's an independent. But is there now an emerging SVOD film? Are there, are there preferences? I mean, I know when I talked to the, an acquisitions guy on, on, on Amazon that, you know, he said basically our, we're just, a, the entire studio is just a loss leader for Amazon Prime. We're just, because you buy, you get six times as much money from someone who's subscribing to Amazon Prime on Amazon products and someone who's not. So we just want to target people who, with these movies, who we want to be on Amazon. I think there's some truth to that, you know. I don't know that they're necessarily making back all the money that they're spending on these movies, but, you know, they, they I mean, Amazon came out of the gate saying very clearly that they wanted awards movies. You know, they wanted like a quality bar, they wanted a certain kind of patina. And they wanted Oscars, that's what they wanted. and. I think that that's because of, this is just my guess, and I'm not friends with Jeff Bezos or anything, but I think they want a certain kind of brand alignment. They want, that, they want people to go, Amazon equals quality equals great equals, I'm gonna buy my stuff from Amazon. Other questions? Yes. What, in your opinion, is Hollywood's view on Well, I mean, everybody loves New Zealand. I'll just say that. <laughs> like, you guys have, uh, you know, obviously Fl Flight of the Concords, while it may not have been a show that was seen all over America, right? Certainly in Hollywood, that movie resonated in the creative community and people just think, you know, all of those guys are absolutely brilliant. Um, I think that, um, there's, there's been some really uh, interesting films come out of, you know, just more traditional dramas, muscular dramas, you know, that kind of thing have come from here. It's a, it's a, it's not a massive, um, you know, you're not making loads and loads and loads and loads of films, so it's, it's specific. But Hollywood doesn't care where talent comes from. They literally, they're so open in that way, and I love that, you know, I mean, you're super advantaged. You, unlike many, uh, unlike many of the filmmakers who, by the way, are doing extremely well in terms of international filmmakers doing extremely well and making a lot of American stuff now because they want that fresh perspective and they want that, you know, different original worldview and voice in in the work that they're getting made. Um, but a lot of those filmmakers don't speak great English. I mean, you guys speak perfect English, so you're straight away, like Australians. You may not understand it, but. Yeah. <laughs> but you're very advantaged. And so I think, you know, it, if you're, you know, you said, what am I looking for? I mean, me personally, I'm looking for filmmakers with a unique point of view, filmmakers where I look at their work and say, wow, I've just never seen the world in that way, you know. Um, something original, something that I haven't seen before. Um, but that obviously ticks all the boxes of tone and atmosphere and performance and story and, you know, kind of, uh, but that's interesting, that's interesting. I think other agents are looking for different things. They're like, can I book him? Can I book her? You know? Um, um, and so, but, but most people are looking for an original voice, I'd say, yeah. 
All right. Um, unfortunately, we are having to finish and we are at the end of our time. Um, Department of Post, thank you again very much for your support for this session. And thanks to Beck. That's been really fascinating. This session is presented by Department of Post. The Big Screen Symposium is brought to you by Script to Screen and j &A Productions. We would like to thank our event partners, the New Zealand Film Commission, New Zealand On Air, Images and Sound, Auckland Tourism Events and Economic Development, and Stage and Screen Travel Services. VoiceOver is provided by Samantha Dukes and music by Poddington Beer.